Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and the September 17th Cloud 2030 discussion about networking was amazing. Caroline McCrory and Ed Horley uh, took us through a whole bunch of stuff uh, with IPv6 and cloud adjacency and um, all sorts of things, and teed up our next conversation where Rich Miller is going to lead us about cloud economics and a whole bunch of other data, serverless uh, conversations coming your way too, um, and uh, programmed inequity, always a uh, lurking behind the surface topic for us also. So tune in and join in at the 2030.cloud. Uh, sign up, be part of the community, and participate, please. We're looking forward to seeing you. Rich, it's, this is not necessarily a hijack, but I think it raises a good point. We've all been, a lot of us have been talking about broadband for all, and it's something that, you know, we're supposed to be the greatest nation in the world, but so many of, of the country is still disconnected. Do you think that if the current regulations on 5G, which is crippling the ability for it to also become a Wi-Fi point, um, is somehow able to be repealed, do you think that would also solve, lead to solving some of that broadband for all issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean... So how do we do that? Well... <laughs> yeah, well, you start with the FCC and work down. Um, you know that there's among other things, but isn't the I mean, Star Wars project supposed to help with that? Oof. Which project? Oh, I, I, you know, Starlight, Starlight, and all oh, yeah. of the all of the you know the CubeSats that and you know kind of creating a mesh. You know, nobody yet has figured out how to repeal the laws of physics and. Um, there's a there's a real difficulty with um, with the use of um, kind of the the LeoSat um, kind of mesh of distribution. Now, one of the things that does help is when you've got IPv6 and you have software definable or software yeah software definable and software manageable networking. You can you can do some really intelligent things, particularly with content. There, you know, you take a look at what is happening, you know, right then, right there to the individual. They're you know they're in a car and moving. They're they're they are uh, going through a tunnel on the on a train and so forth. You can play games with it such that oh you know I want to make sure that. Uh, Rich doesn't lose the, um, you know, the playback of uh, West Wing that he's he's you know scarfing up on on Netflix in order to distract himself, and uh, he's as he's going through the tunnel. So I'll um, use a LeoSat and IPv6 and and the the kinds of capabilities on these devices once you have IPv6 and, and software definable networks to prefetch a lot of that that content and load it in the machine uh, in my iPhone or what have you while I'm going through the the tunnel under the bay for example those are those are the kinds of things that I think you can do with with cubesats but quite frankly uh, you just don't have the latency. Well, you're you're going to fight with latency no matter what. So there's a lot you can do with it, but anything that requires that, you know, five and ten millisecond kinds of of latency, uh, the Leo Sats aren't going to work. I feel so, like we we have some fundamental challenges that we still haven't addressed. I mean, like cell coverage, just fundamental cell coverage. I mean, if we can't solve some of these basic needs, mm -hmm. then how are we gonna solve some of the more advanced things? And and is there still the value of the advanced things beyond just specific use cases? I mean, like for example, on 5G, sorry, I've got 5G on the brain, just came off a, a call with 20 CIOs talking about 5G, but, um, you know, you get into these very specific use cases, you know, using 5G in a factory floor, um, you know, where you can control the factors. But the broader implication, the broader 
um, potential is there, but I think we're just so far off because we haven't been able to solve some of the fundamental things. Like I can't go from my house on Wi-Fi calling to jump out into a cell network without dropping the call. I can't even drive five miles without dropping a call. And so, you know, you have these fundamental challenges that I don't think 5G will necessarily solve. I don't think IPv6 will solve. Um, and I feel like we're, we're kind of running with knives a little bit by focusing on the, the things that are way out there, unless it's going to solve some of these fundamental pieces and maybe I'm missing something along the way. Yeah, I mean, it, the V6 thing is really simple. I mean, 5G just has V6 as an underpin. It's a required protocol within the stack. So it's so it's sort of, sort of uh, I don't know, I sort of think it's sort of futile to talk about V6 and, and 5G because it's just built in as part of the requirement. <laughs> and so it's like it's there and you're going to use it and that's that. Well, actually, that's the question, Ed. Just because it's there, do people use it? I mean, there have been yeah. lots of technologies that we've been carting around with us in our yeah, our laptops and, and our phones that haven't been used. And um, I look at uh, trusted compute um, that's you know built into almost every chip and has been for years. And yet, you know. Oh, you mean you mean on the TPM side, or do you mean like yeah, the Mac? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's yeah. yeah, yeah. Enclaves on enclaves are a hard story because most people yeah. just don't even know how to use them. But, but I, I I guess my point here is. The, the big thing here is, you know, when networks become a real part of building and, and operating applications that are dyna dynamic and that, you know, deal with things like Tim driving, you know, five, five miles and having drops, you know, networks right now are, you know, pretty much nailed down and you, they, you've got you've got SD-WAN, you've got network function virtualization, but it's kind of there, but nobody's actually using it. Yeah, I think, I think so. I, I think on the V6 side, at least, I, I don't worry about that on the V6 side. I mean, we have so many 4G networks. 4G has the same requirement around V6 dependencies. Mm -hmm. So many large mobile providers are already deployed V6. So, I mean, the infrastructure is all there and are all utilizing V6. Whether people know it or not is, I guess, irrelevant. You know, if yeah. you're on T-Mobile and on an iPhone, you're using V6 all the time, every single day, and that's the only protocol you're using. Yeah. Most people don't know that, but, but that's fine. They just provide NAT64, DNS64 for you to get out to the V4 internet. I suppose what's far more compelling and interesting from a storyline case that addresses sort of maybe Tim's point and back to maybe Caroline's original sort of access for all is our lack from a society basis of investing in the right infrastructure through the right means. So if you take what we did in the in the 80s and in the, in the 90s, which is saying commercial entities should own, control, and manage a, a set of resources on behalf of their customers, and that's that's you know I'm I'm just as guilty of this. I was paid as my former life as a civil engineer. I drilled all the cell towers up and down the Central Valley for back then Macaw Cellular, <laughs> right? Just got you know picked up singular AT and T wireless, all the cell towers up and down the Central Valley. But those were all individual, just for them. And the amount of you know shared leasing space and models and how much fiber was pulled and everything else was just repeated over and over, as opposed to maybe you know our federal government or or, or the states investing in for shared resources to sort of help uh, control and mitigate and make sure that access for all was actually happening because you're only going to build capacity where you think people are, so that you can build people to to be able to do that. That doesn't solve the issues of of, of, of access uh, within areas that, that are underserved. And a really great, great yeah. example is, is we don't, we completely ignore, you know, any of the, the native tribal lands that exist in the United States. We see, we pretty much claim that they have to be on their own, even though we don't provide any infrastructure and services for them to be able to do that. They become islands of, or, you know, quite literally deserts of, of coverage and, and access for facilities, just even fundamentals, you know, power, yeah. you know, running water, et cetera, and, and it becomes a huge structural issue, yet we somehow expect them to be able to quote unquote lift themselves up. I don't know how that really works when you don't, you know, mm -hmm. can't even meet society standards. So, so it, no. I, I think it would, it would be fair to say that the technologies are available to make access for all possible. So yeah, yeah, that's a regulatory. There are, then there are a couple of things that one is 
being in, intentional about going after it and then having a, a, a governmental or, and um, regulatory environment that, that fosters it. So it's, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I, I do yeah. agree with you. The FCC is a structural problem about how you get access to the right broadband access. Exactly. The right the right, yeah. the right frequency ranges, the right regulatory, you know, and, and agreements put in place. There, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, V6 is just a very small component of, of, yeah. of overall making things work. I mean, agreed. Uh, v, and V6 was really only, it's, I mean, it's, it's solving a very discreet and fundamental problem. We ran out of V4 address space. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. Now we've worked, we've done awesome engineering work around getting, making v, V4 last as long as it has, but we've reached We've reached the 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 sort of the end rope of the of of what what's possible there without paying a lot of penalties now. So we're starting to pay more and more penalties. So it's just a matter of like at what point does that threshold cross for for you? And then it's also an adoption curve issue of around how many organizations are already there. So all our you know our service providers, our content providers, our home home access networks, our mobile providers are all done with V6. Cloud providers are predominantly done with V6. So that leaves enterprises. And I don't know how that shapes with COVID-19, right? With all of us instead being distributed and work from home. Um, I don't know, do I really care if an enterprise has IPv6 access anymore? <laughs> I don't know, no one's in the office, right? So maybe that doesn't really matter because we've shifted the, the work model and all that matters is, is how we deploy cloud services, which have v6 capabilities and, and the mobile operators are, are pushing for, for folks to have that. So I, I don't know what that's gonna look like here. Um, but the enterprises are definitely, you know, starting to notice because more and more of them want to want to be able to build. At least the ones that I'm talking to, you know, are trying to get, you know, power, lighting controls, sensor networks, you know, a, a bunch of application services deployed at scale. They want mobile applications, direct access to their to their to their customers, and V6 enables all of that, and it enables them to build very large, you know, compute infrastructure for AI and machine learning. You know, some of the HPC stuff that we do is, is based around that. Rob can probably talk a little bit about some of that too, because he's, I know he's worked on some of that. So, I, well, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the, the thing that's weird to me that about V6 that people aren't embracing, and some of this is just networking is incredibly sticky as a legacy protocol. It's, yeah, right? I agree. Yeah. Um, is that it grants a degree of autonomy that I would have expected people to embrace um, and you, you describe this all the time. It's like, yeah, just give yourself a, you know, a, 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 a what, a 28 block or so, you know, you can give yourself, you know, a whole internet worth of addresses for your own use. And those are permanent, persistent blocks of addresses. And so there, we haven't figured out this commercial need. It's actually partly what, like why the question, right? If, if I'm a trucking company, I can give an IP address to every tire, every box, every trailer, every truck, every driver, right? The driver's lunch. And right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could... all that, all that's mine. Right. And, and now all of a sudden I'm like, I don't, I can, I have independence from any network carrier. And I don't understand why that is not more valuable. Yeah. I, I, Are you I, sure I, you have independence from the, from any carrier? Yeah, you do because well, here's the reason why. I mean, all you do is is let's say you're ro you're you're roaming through your address is pinned. All you have to do is basically, because of software defined, you can you can basically say, just advertise out where your where your address location is is available across their co their connections. So if you get T-Mobile, they're providing you a V6 address. You simply just communicate in the home run and say I'm available via via this network to reach me, and that which solves those sort of problems. Yep. I mean, you can technically do this with mobile IPv6. Uh, I would never encourage anyone to, to dig up and do that because it's just a nightmare. And, and uh, you know, I got Joe Davies to remove that chapter out of his book uh, just, well, or at least move it to the appendix because it's, it's so hard to actually implement in practicality. But we have, we have tunnels. We're perfectly comfortable with tunnels and, and doing updates. That yeah. Way, so. and, and getting back to that, I mean, it is hard to do. It's a, it's a hard problem to solve, you know, on a day to day basis and make it make it workable. And it's, uh, you know, we're I, we're not we we just you know we're not quite there yet. <laughs> the yeah, the point I, the point I guess you're you're coming to is you know when and if the 
there's enough of an of an intention and enough of a of a real move to to drive to make what um, Rob is, has just been describing, which is you know that kind of independence, and it's done in a way that feels safe for all of the uh, uh, all of the the neighboring all of the neighboring networks and and safe for the uh, underpinning networks to to uh, you know, convey it and, and permit it um, that's the point in time when you know you you get people working on management and automated controls of these kinds of networks so that the the rank and file user just doesn't even think about it anymore. Uh, yeah, we're not, the, we're not we're, even there we're, yet. Well, we're there in certain fields. I mean, certainly, uh, certainly, if you look at like what John Deere's investment in IPv6 has been in terms of uh, making things dynamically available for the sensor configurations as their devices are out and operating in the fields, being able to build the ad hoc ad hoc network requirements uh, that they want to have from a telemetry and information basis and sensor basis. They've done a great job with that. There's others that are very similar. Uh, BC Hydro up in, up in Canada, you know, two and a half million, you know, um, uh, actual power meters that are up and operational. They don't even have to have continuous end to end point connectivity. They talk peer to peer. They actually run Ripple with V6 and talk peer to peer and are able to work around making all their telemetry information available, uh, basically, so even if they have localized power outages or localized, you know, interruptions due to, you know, whatever, someone's moving in and has big obstructions between it, they all dynamically route through all of that. And they don't have to put in uh, cell towers in the same way that, you know, we sort of traditionally think about from a mobile network basis. And these devices are able to provide telemetry and information back to the power company. They're able to do command and control situations with sort of software defined that sort of says like, hey, we need to, we need to be able to, you know, tune down what, what people are using, or we want to give you credits for, for doing that um, if you participate in the system. And, and, and they're capable of providing all of those sorts of next generation services because of that. Uh, that's a network that is quite literally impossible to build with IPv4. It's not possible to build that size dynamic route based network with with uh with v4 and i and we've built similar stuff um myself and some colleagues have worked on some of the stuff for the marine corps for equipment that gets pushed out of very large aircraft and, <laughs> and lands up on the battlefield and does dynamic um uh sort of association they they want to censor and watch everything that's coming sort of in and out command and control uh and um v6 gives a very unique position because because you're unique in address space you'll never collide with anyone else which guarantees that you have route autonomy, which means that they can push as many of these device sets out of the back of that C-130 to expand or contract their battlefield or area of engagement that they're involved with and never, ever, ever have an address conflict, a network problem, a propagation issue, anything else. And they can, they can guarantee that they can do that. And I'm, and I'm going to put money on the fact that it's going to be those kinds of applications that end up benefiting the the actual access to all types of questions that Caroline was just asking. Yeah. The fact I, I, that you I, I, can move it around and just make it do what you need it to do when you need it to do and not have the requirement that an end user, you know, have a, a, a minor degree in, in uh, networking protocols. That's when it'll happen. So, I mean, I, I remember even 20 years ago, everybody was like, we're going to have mesh networks, right? We're going to peer to peer and, and replicate, mm -hmm. you know, I have one laptop per child stuff. It's like, yeah, you just need one person connected and everybody shares it. Is that going to happen? Why aren't, why aren't we collaborative? Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you what kills that sort of stuff. It's like everyone wanting to stream Netflix all at the same time and, and, and things of that nature, right? There's, there's a difference in terms of consumption of, of, of directionalized consumption and shared bandwidth. And, and there's only so much in terms of how spectrum and, 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 and how we deal with that. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting I and mean, we, we can talk about, I'm working on a super large, you know, you know, um, uh, media outlet broadcast network. <laughs> 
and and multicast is still a really hard problem to solve. It's not easy, and and uh, and how you take SDI feeds and stream them out as IP, and how do you how do you ingest that many different types and nodes of quality of video transmission and turn that into a sourcing stream, and how do you redistribute that traffic? And let me tell you, I'm not building a small network to be able to accommodate everything that needs to happen. Now, granted, these are the folks that are generating the media content, not necessarily the end consumers, but um, the problem right. still exists there for, for getting that sort of information out. It's not ubiquitous, it's not two way, but I don't think we have to solve that problem at scale from, from day one in regards to what an end user experience needs to be. I think we need to solve the, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's sort of twofold. Can, can what we provide scale up to be able to solve uh, at scale across a given set of geography? And then secondarily is, is it meeting the needs of the application services that you wanna run? So Rob is a good example. Is, yeah, you know, if we expect everyone to be on a Zoom call uh, at, in, in, in every geography and have two-way, you know, 1080p, 30 frame per second quality experience, um, that's a very different requirement than all of us watching a 1080p stream. That's a shared resource coming down to us. So the teacher speaking at us as opposed to having two-way. And, mm -hmm. and maybe the two-way is more in a chat or it's more in text base or it's more in you know, um, you know, raise your hand, then I turn you on sort of, sort of experience that could service a given set of markets. And uh, today we expect uh, the sort of broadband, high access broadband to be available for everyone everywhere. Uh, if we try and move to 4K and 8K digital streaming, I mean, I, I think people don't really understand what 4K at 30 frames per second and 60 frames per second actually does to a network. Terms right. of, in terms of in terms of capacity and and um, I I know major media outlet networks uh, and I'm working for one of them right now and you know 4K is not even on their roadmap for their internal IPTV nets it's only designed for for an SDI feed to go out to the major carriers if they just choose to provide it to the to their end customers but even for themselves internally they try and reduce how much they're taking on 4K and 8K is is a laughing is a laughing matter. Um, from a consumption basis over the network. So there's still structural limitations about what we can do there. That's not solved with V4 or V6. Like neither one of, a networking protocol fundamentally isn't gonna solve that issue. I think what V6 solves is we stop thinking about how many hosts we have in the network, Rob, right? Like we've talked about this tons and tons of times. Like trying to sit around and figure out like what size network I need to run in V4 in order to support the number of hosts I have you just stop thinking about that. You only think about how many networks you need to operate. You don't think about how many devices you have in a given network. You don't worry about how small or how large it is. That issue just goes entirely away. And I think it's a very interesting concept for, for folks that are running like large retail chains and running large distributed, um, you know, uh, small to very large distributed components. I got a, I got a well, huge warehouse all the way down to a small little tiny you know, facility that has, you know, point and stock solutions. So it's literally like a kiosk. How do you build an addressing plan and, and an address network allocation that can work for all of them? And V6 gives you that flexibility to be able to do that. Whereas V4 is a complete nightmare. Well, and Ed, you just brought up that whole distributed element of things. You know, uh, I'm seeing with a lot of my clients, they're starting to look at how to use the network in a more holistic way versus just the traditional thing of I'm going to pick two data centers and then I'm just going to connect my offices to those data centers in the old network hub and spoke way to now more of a spine and leaf, you know, which brings in the whole cloud adjacency piece. Um, right. I said, I said this a few weeks ago that now Colo is sexy again because it's cloud, it's, it's cloud adjacency. It's yeah. your on-prem version of a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud, however you want to look at it, whatever term you want to put on it. But really what you're doing is you're now looking at colo providers who are more network savvy, like the Equinixes and the digital realty with, you know, Megaport and all those sort of things and picking right. who has the best access for all of the different network connectivity requirements you have. Right. And so yeah. you bring up a really good point about if you're going to a distributed data center model, and you're going to really deploy true spine and leaf, how do you control it if you're only using V4 and you don't have a V6 plan? Is it even right. possible? Well, it's possible, but I think you end up put, putting a lot more effort in. I think the other part of it is, is that suddenly you're, you're trying to divvy up a very narrow medium of resource or V4 resource and 
more than likely RFC 1918, and figuring out how to give Amazon part of it and how to give Azure part of it and how to give Oracle Cloud part of it and how to give, you know, DigitalOcean part, like it becomes this, how, how much, how scarce of my resource can I divide up among all those things after I've already allocated a huge swath of that for my own internal network. So it becomes very hard to, to manage that. And, and, and for the, I, I it's sort of funny, I call all those services the cloud highway. I call those interfaces cloud highways because what you're doing is basically providing a highway onto those cloud on, on ramps, right? To, to get to each one of the providers. So, and, and we built a couple of interchanges around that sort of construct. But I think V6 becomes unique because at least the two biggest public cloud providers, AWS and Azure, allow you to do bring your own addressing. So you can do bring your own addressing with V6. Well, suddenly you can operate your own controlled address space and you can make that as part of your resource request from in North American Aaron, or if you're in, you know, if, if you're in Europe, RIPE, or if you're in Asia, Asia Pacific, it's APNIC, you can make that as part of your request. And so suddenly it changes your thought mentality about how much address space you should actually request and, 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 and look to use because you're no longer constrained around how much you can provision, which is becomes really important when you're looking at trying to build large scale compute that allows direct, direct connectivity without having to go through too many gateways or NAT translations or too much state, yeah. you can just route. And so routing becomes, you know, well, I guess routing becomes sexy again. And, and, you, and you don't have the brittleness around state locations. Well, let's face it. I mean, part of the constraints that we do, the reason we go hub and spoke model is because we have brittleness in our routing architectures that force yes. us to bring state through a single device. In yep. order to maintain that state there, we don't have the capabilities mm -hmm. to just route in a, in, a, in a free format. And actually, if I bring my own address space to Amazon, I don't care if they route that across their backbone or across my backbone, because if I'd write rules that just say it's my address space, my slash 28 that I have, I'm building slash 36s for each one of my, each one of my, um, my cloud, cloud providers. And they take that 36 and break it down per their regions and you know, per my VPCs for you know, or Azure per VNets, based off of you know, what I need to build for availability zones or availability sets, depending on which category you're in, um, you suddenly get a lot of flexibility where you, you don't care. You could directly back, pack, pass yeah. traffic across their backbone. You could pass it down to you. You could pass it directly to your customers. You could pass it directly to your partners. And you, get, you gain back- It just changes. It yeah, changes the way to, you go to market. Yeah, you don't have the brittleness of like, I have to do translation at this point. Like I, I have to go through this narrow gateway set for firewall enforcement. It's like, no, just put the same firewall policy everywhere because it's just, it's just my address. I don't care. So it becomes a unique value proposition that way. Uh, and that translates to the flip side, the opposite side, which is the mobile network, the mobile ingress network. Yes. So, so suddenly all your mobile devices who all have V6 addresses and can directly reach that, uh, you can, if you control the app, like you drop an app on, you can actually drop an address on there and actually validate who's what mobile device in addition as an additional credential item. Like today we saw that in V4 with just dropping certificates or another sort of, of GUID on there. But there's no reason that you can't hand, hand out a, a, you know, a 128 address out of a given range set and assign it for, 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 for a mobile app. In fact, I've proposed to some banking institutions that they should, you know, in a cluster, they should just assign a 64 that the only purpose for that, for that 64 is to build a unique session for a given payment transaction. You just build the session once, you never use it again. You just throw the address away. Huh. Everyone's like, that's insane. That's like incredibly wasteful. And I go, maybe, but it's unique at a point in time with a single transaction that will never go away. So when you need to look it up in your log file, you will never have a duplicate ever. And that has some unique value proposition when you're a global organization trying to correlate data from everywhere. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help if you're just a single shop, but when you're trying to run payment transactions from China and trying to track what happened activity-wise across your global network, you don't know what the, if, if it's RFC 1918 everywhere and you're going through all, you have to carry all this that state and your logging files get exponentially bigger as you go through all of that. V6 solves that problem because you're unique in that point in time. And so it sort of solves that. So I, I think that's, that's pretty cool in terms of, in terms of something folks uh, could sort of consider. And, and, and just to do the math, and because everyone always sort of questions me on this one, so I'll do the math for you real quick. A slash 64 and V6, if you were to use 10 million addresses a second and never reuse that address, it's 10 million a second, you're just burning through it. It's going to take you 58,000 years to burn through your 64, right? So 
your data center is probably not going to be here. And I'll, I'll argue at least in a thousand years, your data center is not going to be here. I'll probably argue in a hundred years, your data center is not going to be where it's at. You're going to change your address and you need to move stuff. So that single 64 of 48 is what you give for a site as normal. You have 65,536 slash 64s in a single site 48. Um, so arguing about running out of addresses for that sort of transaction load at 10 million a second. Um, I don't know a lot of shops that generate that sort of transaction load. I don't even know a lot of machines that can turn up and keep 10 million state sessions available at one moment and then do that every second. <laughs> are we moving into more of the uh, sensors that are in oil and gas pipelines at that point? Well, those, so what's important for sensor networks that's unique about V4 versus V, or V6 versus V4 is that in V4, we have to do all sorts of things within the gateway to keep states alive. So we always have to do these trickle, keep alive sort of things within the application stack in order to keep a session open in order to report back data. Mm -hmm. What's unique about V6 is I don't have to do that anymore. So I can tell the end sensor device, just go to sleep and keep your address as long as you freaking want. Go to sleep for half an hour, come back up on network, and just send your traffic payload and drop back off. Whereas before I'm telling you, hey, wake up every few, few moments because you have to send this keep alive payload in order to keep the gateway registered for you in order to keep the session transaction alive. I don't care about that information anymore or doing that activity, which means my battery life for a small you know, coin size battery can go from, hey, I might get you know, a couple months, maybe a year out of that thing to I can, I can last substantially longer based off of what the battery life type and criteria and how it's built. Uh, it just changes how long sensor networks can, can stay alive and provide telemetry information versus, so the use cycle for replacement for that device becomes much more around the utility of it versus the, how long is the battery actually good for? Well, um, and then and we that's, have, that's oh, a totally we have issues with applications where that have been built with those keep alive into the code so that the apps themselves don't freak out if they don't pick up a sensor. So if we were to think about that, and I think actually Tim Crawford, this is something I think you might have some insight on. If, that, if applications have been hard coded to do some of those keeper lives so that the state stays active, what do you think percentage wise of applications out there today would need to be not rewritten, but have those statements you know, re redesigned in the application so that they can take advantage of V6? I mean, on the surface, a lot. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's... 99%? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, I guess the, the thing you have, to, you have to think about is that it's not just the legacy... It, it's not just legacy in the sense that it's an application that was written five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but it's also legacy thinking. It's applications that are being written right now that'll be written next week, next month, next year. And they're still using that legacy thinking, right? That keep alive thinking. And so until you change not just the architecture, but the thinking and the te underlying technology, um, all of those have to come together at the same time. And it's going to take quite a bit of work to get there there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be so done. Along, along those lines, I mean, part of my takeaway so far in the conversation is that in 10 years, the networking we've got today, like V6 is, that's what we're gonna have. It's incredibly hard to change. Yep. Right, there's a, there's a lot of inertia. There's not something the, else. That's, that's the most important point. I, it's, it's always funny, I talk to people. There is, there's no other there's networking nothing else. protocol standard. Yeah, and this is it. There's no one else submitting anything. There's no one else's architecture decision. There, there's no other submitted standard. There's nothing else that's built in and already been distributed into all the, every major operating system. That's taken us 25 years to get, or 20 years to get yeah. that going. So. But, but so here's, but here's, here's my question on that, that from there though, because we always predict, and I think it's accurate that sensor data and thing data is going to eclipse people data. Right. Yeah. So we're, we're, you know, we're focused on Zoom calls because that's what we're on. But are we going to end up, you know, in future networks being much more worried about timely access for sensor data or for autonomous trucks driving, you know, across the, the you know, the open areas in the U.S.? Is that going to lead you're, to rich? You're really asking a question of is latency important? And what the application would okay. be. At, at, when I say application, right. I don't mean an app. 
but the use the usage of it and then you know i think we go back to protocols i think igmp will actually become sexier again <laughs> if we were to actually have proper v6 because to to tim's point it's late is latency important and then you really have to think about which classes have more priority over what the other traffic does because of right. what it's carrying. Right. The other thing, you know, kind of going back to something that that um, maybe a little tangential to what Rob was saying, I, I was just going, just kind of using my own home is kind of a test bed. Um, you know, your average environment, nothing really critical. You know, I don't have a test lab or or something kind of out there that would cause a lot of additional um, technology to come into the mix. But I'm just looking at the number of devices that, it, that are on right now. And this doesn't even represent all of the devices that are connected to my current network. I have over 40 devices in my home. There are four <laughs> of us that live in this house, over 40 devices. So, I mean, you start adding that up. I mean, that, that grows pretty quickly to a point that you can't you can't manage that and so you then have to think about prioritization um around what traffic is most critical i mean is it the mobile traffic or voice traffic that's most critical is it the video traffic that's most critical what about the gaming and so you know latency plays a role into this so i think all of these kind of come together um to think about how do you solve these problems and the underlying infrastructure plays a role in that. Because if I was writing on 5G, I might have a different answer than my current situation, which I'm writing on fiber. But it's, I think it's a big problem. Yeah, I think there's two separate spaces. There's a space for the home consumer side. Maybe there's a couple. There's a home consumer side space, which, which is, is really an end and ends and maybe a sort of analogous to an edge model of like, how do I deal with a set of autonomous resources to be able to build networks in, in a way that is uh, cost effective, efficient and easy. And there's a, there's a set of working groups that are trying to solve some of that. Apple's participating in that, right? In terms of how do we build and structure that? I think on the enterprise side for sensor networks, for, for you know, that's, that's much more around a set of ecosystems that, that can do that at scale and has pre-built platforms and, and solutions around some of that. And I think that's, you know, um, you, you might see portions of that touch each other. So the con I, there's a big initiative, you know, Apple's part of it, it's the Connected Home IP, uh -huh. Connected Home Over IP Network project. And that project is, is V6, it's V6 only actually. So you don't even get to do V4, even if you want to do. Uh, it's a V6 only related project that they're working on in terms of, in terms of doing that sort of service. Most of the large scale IoT sensor networks that are done at very large scale are, are V6 only using things like six, you know, six low pan and, and other initiatives around that. But then you get back to the, how do we run an enterprise and cloud services and things of that nature that all have to consume the stuff that these, these networks are built, right? They're really the, the, end, the end server side of, of we need to touch that to get data or we need to touch that to get you know, uh, that's where our AI and machine learning and our, you know, our office collaboration tool suites are, are running, whatever else you want to have up there. I think that's the interconnect problem that's yeah. a, not well defined today about how that's going to work because not everyone's on board the same way. <laughs> yeah. No, and Ed, to your point, I mean, to be fair, I'm, I'm talking obviously about residential, but I think the, the commercial application is just exponentially greater than that. So if you have this kind of complexity at a residential level, and granted my home is is fairly modern. I mean, it's brand new. It's it For those of you that don't know, we just built a new home. And so new construction, there there are some, some nice kind of technological advances with it, but we don't have uh, Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs or anything like that into the mix. And still you have you know, over 40 devices on the network. I think when you get to a commercial or enterprise state, that number just, and the complexity just goes exponentially greater. And so that's why I'm like, how do we start to solve some of these problems? Because it's not just simply connectivity, but it's also, we have to think about bandwidth. We have to think about where compute comes in. Um, like on my last call, we were talking about 
what gets uh, addressed at the edge versus what goes to cloud? You know, do, will edge and 5G networks, will that circumvent cloud? Now, and I think I, just, you know, and, and in everything in between, right? It's not one or the other. And Paul's brought up a really good thing he typed into the chat, right? He said, true cloud neutral, including non-vendored functions running as invalidated, a validated running in multiple clouds. Is that even possible? And then he goes, how comfortable are folks with validating a container in one runtime environment, but not all environments? And how much mm -hmm. validation is needed for cloud native apps on each target cloud? That, that's actually, I, I think that's one of the, the best questions from a practical enterprise use case, because we talk about this whole thing with multi-cloud and cloud adjacency. You know, how do we, uh, other than having something like Kubernetes that, is, that unifies, that's supposed to unify a runtime across the different, you know, the different cloud providers, supposed to, <laughs> Tim's already shaking his head, um, to help with, I guess, some of this validation. I, I, Paul brought up a really good point. You know, what are, what are people's thoughts on that? Ooh, Addressing Paul. is one piece, right? Paul Tesh, who's on, the, who's on the call, he, he typed it into the chat. And I'm like, all right, buddy, you're it. It was it. a joke. It was I a know. joke. <laughs> no, I, I suppose I have a couple of thoughts on that one, which is, which is, uh, depending on your underlying, I, I don't know. I, maybe, maybe Tim has some thoughts around the multi-cloud discussion. I, I just haven't seen a lot of, of operational folks that have chosen to deploy the same application running simultaneously in multiple clouds um, and, and find that as a good uh, business use case. There are obviously a few exceptions, uh, I've worked with one or two, but um, that's usually more of a parallel workload thing than a serialized workload thing. And uh, I, think, I think people choose to deploy based off of their, their sets of teams, individuals' experiences around expertise within that given set of cloud and using that environment to be able to solve a problem. And as long as the data sharing isn't an issue, uh, you, you pick what's appropriate. Usually the addressing isn't a huge problem. The only one that I've run into where that's the case is, is a few, if you're, uh, there's some structural problems about assumptions that are made for deployments for Kubernetes in, in Azure and in AWS, where if you choose the overlapping address space, you will actually functionally break the interconnect for, for, for the Kubernetes cluster itself if you don't read the documentation, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because they make assumptions about what address range they use. You obviously avoid that issue with v6, but there hasn't been a single public cloud provider that I've seen that's got a Kubernetes implementation running with v6 that I'm aware of. Rob, you might know differently, but I'm not aware of a single not, one. Not that I'm aware of. But but yeah. I, I think there's a deeper problem with v6. And right, we come back, we come to adjacency, which is the, the data. And, and we're right. about that's to have exactly a where I was going to go. Yes. Right. It right. I mean, Kubernetes has no container placement algorithm. And I haven't seen any changes to their placement algorithms. Mm -hmm. that actually is mm -hmm. smart enough to say this container needs to move to this cluster and rewire itself based on this latency or this data availability or the fact that, you know, asking for this data is about to cost me, you know, a million dollars this month because I'm crossing a egress boundary. And, and when Ed was going through his kind of um, analysis just a few minutes ago, he, he qualified it uh, with respect to, you know, uh, the issues of data and data moving or data being present at a particular, you know, at a particular venue on a, on a different cloud. Um, it's intel, well, two things, intelligent data replication is still a, you know, a really, you know, hard animal to find in in any in, you know by any means any stretch but then that whole area is being um basically it's uh, it's a problem for any customer primarily because of the um the pricing approaches that the cloud service providers themselves have imply in you know uh, imposed upon all of us by saying, sure, bring your data to us, it's free to enter. Oh, you wanna leave? You wanna move it somewhere else? Uh, now we're gonna charge you, buddy. And that yeah, is enormous. It's an enormous barrier to exit. And, you know, this is the, you know, well, this is the Roach Motel. 
Yeah, that's a financial model, but you have to remember that uh, unlike unlike the rest of the resources from a virtualized uh, cloud cloud basis, uh, um, network is not elastic in the same way when they're building infrastructure facilities. Exactly, uh, a hundred gig port is going to cost exactly that, and if you expect hundred. When you when you when you cut an agreement for how much I/O you're getting out of a of, of a given, um, you know, virtual machine instance or anything else that you purchase, that's that's a guarantee level that they're, they're that they're making off that commit off the backside, which means that they have to build a fabric that is infinitely larger than what anyone is thinking in terms of mm -hmm. capacity and, and payload, yeah. and just because they're choosing to offset the costs. The cost factors in terms of which direction i actually think they did a disservice i think they should have charged people for ingress portions even if it's a small incremental amount because there's a there's a perceived cost difference right this gets to like you know the priceless book and stuff like that around the per perceived costing points that mm -hmm. that there that networking costs nothing that is just part of the the fundamental cost structure and that they are only just making money Right, it's a, it's a pure money grab in order to get your data out of the network, and that's just not a true fact. The amount of network infrastructure you have to build and the cost associated with that is substantial. Right. And even putting a trinkle charge on the way in for data would have proven that it it does have a cost association, and that sure. it's not a it's not a free service that actually. I don't, I don't think anybody. Money. I don't think anybody is um, arguing that it is free and that that infrastructure to make all of that happen just comes automatically. And, you know, if anybody is making that and, and using that as a justification for, you know, re, you know, killing the pricing that's approach, you know, that uh, I get hit with every time I move, even within a cloud service provider from zone to zone. Um, mm -hmm. No, I, I buy, I buy the point that the, it has a cost and but I do object to the pricing and the approach to pricing and the only technical technological fixes that I've seen that would reduce that or make better use of it would be intelligent replication of data where you had data from the outside outset that was tagged that would be for all intents and purposes replicated at the right place the right zone the right csp well and not replicated elsewhere and done in a way that is um you know under under programmatic and end user control it yeah, doesn't but if, if, it's not available if if you're going to do intelligent data replication though that gets into things like data curation data quality limit yeah absolutely data. right uh, and we don't have that. We, we've treated data like data. So we move things, you know, at a non granular level from data exactly to and that that I, I and I will, you know, I will get on that soapbox on a yeah. regular basis that it's a it is it is wrong, wrong, wrong. Yeah, they uh, treat it, so wait, they treat wait, it like we, a static we are, resource. We are, we are out, we're out of time. <laughs> Rich, Rich just teed up next week's <laughs> session about cloud economics because Damn I, right. I think no matter what architecture <laughs> little stuff we think is the right choice, it's going to be economics that are going to decide a lot of this stuff. So It's certainly going to be a lot. That's next week. And everybody's all of a sudden activated and wants to talk in the last seven <laughs> seconds. So I'll shut up. Go ahead. I, go I, I apologize. I got to run right now. Yep. No worries. Bye. I got to take care. Take care, everyone. This is a great yeah. discussion. Thank you, everyone. Very you fun. Very fun. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we manage, manage it pretty well. But, and it looks like fall season's like, IT and discussions and stuff like that is ramping up. Have people been to any remote conferences? Uh, I'm going to miss be... my escapes. Yeah, no, I'm I'm presenting for Interop, so I'm doing a a three hour workshop for Interop. Um, so that'll, you know, so we've been planning and programming around that, and that's not until October, I think. Okay. So, so I'm doing that one. No, that was going to be in Austin. I still think of it as like Austin. <laughs> Well, it was supposed to be the VM world, free VM world. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's all happening. Yeah, we're gonna do a. Um, 
watch party for a, a session on VMware. It'll be promoted through the Cloud 2030 stuff. Um, nice. Yeah, I saw that. I'm wor yeah, I'm working on the tech setup for it. So we, we did a dry run on Tuesday. It was bumpy. So I'm going to have at least one more practice session. For the but watch party? For the watch party. Well, the question is, do you talk over people? Right, do you talk over the speaker? How do you have the discussion? We're gonna go the what we're gonna go the session and then we're planning a 30 minute, 40 minute discussion and we can try and invite the speakers to come in, we'll get all that stuff rolling today. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose I suppose it depends on who it is, is the answer, right? About whether you speak over someone or not. Yeah. Um, and that's so what I'm what I'm looking what I'm looking to do is uh, I think I can do real time transcription, like show a window for real time. <laughs> uh, I'm promoting people. Sorry, I got behind while I was thinking. Um, the we'll do real time transcription of the talk. Hey, Andrea. Um, We'll do the video for the talk. We'll do real time transcription for the talk, and then we'll do the chat window. I think, and then mostly leave it quiet. Right. But but then the video the the screen will have you know both the live transcription, so we could talk over if we wanted and not miss something. And then um, right. if I can get it right, it's, it's pushing my OBS skills a bit. Yeah. Hi everyone. Hey, Andrea. All right, I'm getting everybody in. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have an icebreaker question if people if people want it. Do it. Um, and uh, see if that gets gets things rolling. Um, oh, since since Ed here, I'll use my IPv6 icebreaker question. No, no. <laughs> the uh, the, what I was what I was going to ask is um, if you could if if you had your own IPv6 domains, which you do, what would what would be something you would give IPv6 addresses? What would My sonar speakers. <laughs> <laughs> something something you know, something that needs a, you know, you want to have a unique <laughs> unique address for um, something like. Uh, for me, uh, this is so like all those, I, I love the interconnect, the quick connects for the hose, but I keep losing them. So I'd love for each one of those to have its own address so it can tell me where it was. And and if it was on <laughs> and how much water was in, then actually maybe you'd even be able to turn them off. But what be, would be something that would be interesting to have a unique unique addresses for that you, you wouldn't normally uh, think of? Uh, probably just, like well i suppose the obvious ones if you're at home is just like being able to have something that just assigns stuff inventory and controls for things like food in the pantry and everything else right so you just don't have to think about that sort of stuff so you just sort of know but yeah i it's 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 weird because i'm i'm not as i even though i'm a v6 person i was not as much as an instrument you know doing the home networking instrument everything all the things <laughs> i know there are a lot of other people that are that are way into that um uh, it's, uh, I suppose maybe my, maybe we have a huge collection of books. <laughs> so books might be one thing that could be useful that way. Cause sometimes I forget what I have. So. Just because you can, doesn't mean that you should. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, case in point. So one of our new ovens is Alexa enabled. And so it's Wi-Fi enabled, which is great for timers and whatnot but you can also attach it to Alexa. And so one of the things, I gotta be careful because she's listening. Um, but one of the things you can do is you can basically ask a certain someone to turn, turn on the oven light. And I'm like, okay, so what's the practical use of that? You know, I mean, really? Why not just go over, because you gotta see it anyway. No, but she, yesterday I told my husband to turn the put the potatoes in at six thirty. So he said in a timer with Alexa. And now I wouldn't even have to bother Walter. Well, that you can do. So you oh, can. Oh, so he you still can... would have had to open the door to put the potatoes in. 
Yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> but what you can do is start getting really clever with uh, timing. And, and we see this like with smokers. Uh, some of the new Wi-Fi enabled smokers can not just manage the heat and temperature, but when the internal temperature gets to a certain temperature, then it essentially changes the temp. So you can create this really kind of jagged profile depending on what you're trying to do. Now that's just cooking, but I, again, I go back to just because you can do it, is everybody going to do it? I don't know. You know the guy who made the Instapot? He made like maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. He just programmed the pressure cooker. This is supposed to be really good. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah Everyone raves about them. Everybody loves it, including me, my wife, the whole family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not for fried rice, though. The Instapot fried rice is awful. <laughs> uh, okay. I still use a wok for that. Exactly. <laughs> we just made that the other night. Yeah, nothing, nothing replaces a traditional rice cooker, so. To that, to that. I, I like the I like Rick Parker's uh, suggestion of light bulbs. Yeah, light bulbs are interesting. I, I, I clearly bigger homes, light bulbs, speaker systems. There's tons of stuff. I mean, uh, you know, Vint Cerf has his entire wine cellar, you know, instrumented and censored, so he knows all the temperatures and everything else that's that's working through that. So, so I mean, uh, there's clearly use cases that make sense for for the right people. I guess if you're a big cigar collector, you could do the same thing. I don't know, but. So you could you could actually embed a sensor network in each cork, right? And then each cork could be connected. I don't know all the details, but he's got that a pretty extensive amazing. network built for that, apparently. So that'd be dangerous. You yeah. already have enough trouble with um, cork and and wine spoilage. I mean, adding another variable to that. I think his is just. Wines. I think his is just external sensors that just lay up against, and so that would make more sense rack for, for everything. So yeah, you don't need to tap inside it. I can't imagine the ambient temperature is that different from the liquid versus the glass versus what's the outside air, unless you're changing the temperature wildly. No, my my thought wasn't necessarily that you would tap inside of it, but that you would use the space in the it's you know like in the top of the cork, like to give you the, you know, you could even do jolt sensors and know if the model was being moved. I, there's there's use, maybe. If you drink it, if you drink it faster, you don't need any of that. See, no. I don't have right. any. <laughs> and I there's was... Manny. <laughs> Wait, Mike, I didn't want to sound. I mean, <laughs> you buy it at Trader Joe's and it's gone that night. <laughs> no need and you spend three ninety nine. Actually, I'd like to ask. I'd like to hear Rich. Uh, Miller's what he would do with IPv6. Well, I sure would not start with instrumenting wine bottles. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, my house, well, you? for my house. Yes. <sighs> You know, personally, I'm, I don't need that much automation in the house. Um, I can see lighting and, and anything that's energy consumption that yep. would be better thought of and better managed by, you know, just putting a few rules in place or some policies. But other than that, I can't imagine doing that much with IPv6 or the kind of the biggest issue in far as, as far as I'm concerned is having um, IPv6 and then um, all of the endpoints that are going to be running on my iPhone, iPad, multiple computers in the house. That's what's going to be more more to the point. And um, the fact is also, I think that Wi-Fi, as we now know, it will kind of go away such that what happens is you have, you know, most of us will have fiber to the curb or fiber to the neighborhood. And then you have a, a fairly high functioning, you know, wireless mechanism that gets from your home to, or office to that 
that point, that juncture point, that's where IPv6 is going to make the big difference. So you think it'll all move 5G versus everyone running their own Wi-Fi? Well, yeah, or some form of some some form of 5G. I think you know the, maybe over some extended period of time, but well, not anytime soon. And it depends no. on the neighborhoods you're in too, because as utilities are going more underground, it starts to create problems for cellular networks where they just don't have poles to, to mount oh. to. And then the whole that point, creates a the whole, whole point issue. there, the whole point there, Tim, is that 5G in this country is, is kind of being I Born say hijacked, <laughs> but let's say <laughs> crippled, <laughs> crippled. Yeah. Um, and, and the selection of frequencies that are being established for 5G make it really difficult to use it as a substitute for or a replacement for, for Wi-Fi. If in fact we had, you know, a rational a rational policy regarding 5G, and then I I would say you're, I uh, you'd get around or at least not have to deal with the problems you've just you know brought up. But the problem here is today. Um, yeah, it's not going to happen soon. It in, and there are a number of folks who have kind of a vested interest in seeing that it doesn't happen soon. So yeah, so, I'm not, so I'm not I, wild about it. 